Okay, my friends, the road to Slammiversary is something I just said in the previous video. I'm not going to repeat. And I want to say there will be no images in this video. It's too hot in my apartment right now. It's nearly 80-something degrees. I'm, I'm not in the mood to edit anything right now other than put the intro in and that's it. <sighs> Let me give it to you like this. As you see from the title, you ask a lot of questions. What we getting going to Slammiversary? And what did we actually see when it comes to the dating part, which I'll get to the end of this review. But I will say this. This was not a bad show. I will not tell you it was bad. It wasn't. The backstage segments were okay, generally. Knowing that the road to December versus being set up as a qualifier, you got several matches that's going to lead into a six-man elimination match that will be at December versus. At least that's something set up for Moose. I will say that's good. And that leads me into the opening of the show. And I need you to tell me, did you see anything for Don West? Because when I came in to watch it, as you already know, when Impact starts, they do like a, a kind of like a repeat of what happened before they play the intro. I missed that. So if there was anything for Don West, because since they're in Chicago, and this was the anniversary of Don's birthday, and they're in Chicago where he came from, I don't know if they did any tribute nights. I, or not, so you tell me. But seeing that Dirty Dango now going by Johnny Dango Curtis, I'd rather see him as Johnny Curtis, but Johnny Dango Curtis, JDC. Eh, not bad. It, it's not a bad thing. Now, the thing I liked about the segment the most is when, and it wasn't Alicia, Alicia was annoying, which she's supposed to be. Alicia Edwards is supposed to annoy you. That's her job, so she did it well. That is her job. Whether you find her appealing as a wrestler or a, a manager or a woman, it, it, it's up to you. But I will say she was very effective in her job. She was trying to be annoying. Kneeling like this. I mean, not kneeling, but kind of going like this in her dress, trying to piss you off, trying to try to be something she's not. It's what she's supposed to do, and there's no problem. Seeing Eddie do what he did was fine as well. But the person who spoke the best was Johnny Curtis. Let, let's, make it, let's make it clear. Dirty Dango gave us a lot of context of how he's really close to everybody in the system except for Moose. He knew Eddie from the very beginning. They both started together 21 years ago. He met a Alicia Edwin when she was 15 years old. She started, when did she start wrestling? Like 17 years ago? She's in her late 30s now. So he knew her when she was a teenager when she wanted to start wrestling. And if I remember correctly, Johnny Curtis came up in OVW with a, along with her, Kurt Hawkins, who was Brian Myers, but also a Matt Cardona known as Zack Ryder. So he knows all three of these guys. So, well, he knows all of them generally. So he's connected to everybody there except for Moose. But Moose doesn't trust him, but he said simply, I don't trust you, but you can join the system. You just got to prove it. But he made it very clear that when it comes down to it, I've been unbeatable and the, and the system's unbeatable. And then we get a little bit of the uh, director of authority. <laughs> I never get bored of Santino Morella. He can still keep doing what he does. As a director, as the main the general manager, he's fine. He did get out of character once he finished his little bit when it came to Johnny Curtis. Or Johnny Dango Curtis. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta remember to put the Dango in there. But you could hear in his voice, he wasn't doing the Italian bit anymore. He let that bitch go. Because he wanted to make it clear that when Slamiversary rolls around, he wanted to explain what the road to Slamiversary is. And the six... Eliminator challenge. Well, six eliminator match, not challenge. Where they're going to have matches for five guys. That's going to go with Moose. And it's going to be an eliminator match. So that's what we got at least set up for the men. I don't know what they're going to do with Jordan Grace for the women. And I know people going to say, dude, it's going to be Natalia. It's going to be someone else. I'm not guessing. I'm going to be like any ordinary fan. And I'm going to see what they're going to give us. We now know. That Moose will have five people he's going to deal with. So that's it. Let's just make it clear. 
And this is something you need to come with terms with. I am not going to guess. I'm not going to speculate. I'm not going to do predictions. Unless something bad is going on or something good is going on, I am leaving it blank for the women. I'm leaving it. It doesn't matter if Natalia goes there. I don't care. Jordan Grace deals with Bianca Belair. I'm not saying they will. I'm just saying whatever, I'm going to leave it. So... Let's move on to the first match, the Hex versus Spitfire. I didn't expect Hex to win here because as far as I know, the Hex are not signed to TNA. Spitfire is. And since we didn't see the semi-manager of Fredrickson, he's not there right now. They didn't, they didn't lose. Not saying that he caused them to lose all this time, but he's not there this time. I'm just wondering how many more recordings do we have with the Hex, with Allison and Marty. I don't know. I'm wondering if we're going to keep having them for another couple of months and then they are done and we will not see them again. And that is when the tag titles are not, not going to mean anything. I'm, I'm making it very clear. As it comes to Alicia Edwards and Marsha, I am bored. I'm sorry. This is not about if I hate the tag titles for the knockouts. It's not about that. It's about them being relevant. It's about them showing women that they'll wrestle against. And simply put, the Hex is just one of if they have more women come in. If they do not have more women come in so Alicia and Marsha can show their dominance, like when we had MK Ultra, why am I going to care? I'm not going to care about the tag titles. And I know people say, dude, who cares about them now? I do. Because they have the titles, they should do something with them. But it's just me. Now, next. What did we get when it came to Asha Elegance versus a Heather Reckless? Now, I think I've seen her once before. Heather Reckless. I'm sure I saw her once before, Heather Reckless. And she looks interesting. But as it stands, how TNA does not show new women on TV often and bring in outside talent frequently, she was nice to see. She's a good-looking woman, and she wrestled decently well. She had a little bit of attitude when it came to the concierge, the Iceman himself. But as it stands, yes, she whooped that ass, and that was Ash of Elegance. She did a decent job. The problem here is that we need more women to come and job. I'm sorry. The division feels completely empty. We haven't even seen Rosemary who... With a knife. Like that. We haven't seen her. We've seen her once. Once showing herself with a knife. And the problem is the division feels completely empty. Empty. Completely barren of women in the knockout division. Whether it's a tag division or the regular division. And this is a major problem they need to solve immediately. Because as much as they touted that win against the all came. And I know someone's going to say, I know someone's going to say this. And I'm going to counter it again. Because as much as Tom said, this, this Teen A Plus show is the biggest show we've ever had. Because we had so many subscribers to the Teen A Plus app. It is more than anyone has ever subscribed at any time since the app was in existence. Wonderful. And I know people would say, you see, there, there goes the fans. Then why did they say, and it was reported, that the TNA brass were upset that the ratings are so low? At 19,000. I know someone's going to say, dude, I left you a message before there was 90,000 that was reported. Well, wonderful. What was it before that? Not just 19,000. I know the numbers for TNA have been in the 70s. 70,000. Maybe 80. Very rarely they've been cracking 100. Rarely. As much as you want to say this, when they were in pack, they were, at one point, they were hitting 104,000. They did that last year. When was the last time they did it this year? Very little. People barely even knew that TNA was rebranded back to TNA. And then when they went to 19, they were so angry. And yes, they've now gone to 90,000. And now, yes, they're doing the app. 
But if their own, stay calm, if their own management teams are angry that they're saying this, and then you have Tom say, well, we had the most subscribers to the TNA app that has ever been seen. Why did you open your stupid mouths and let the media know your thoughts? And that Jordan Grace had spoke about it and she was actually touting her own management saying, why the hell are you complaining? We do a good job. And then she had to delete it. Who is at fault here? If you do not want to hear this, tough shit. TNA has an issue. Management. It doesn't matter if it's the new president. It doesn't matter if the people in marketing, if it's the ones that are in creative themselves, like Tommy and like, um, well, I'll move on to, let's say, sorry, I bumped my, my shit being pissed. And a steal in a, well, a street fight with Kaz, which was all right. It wasn't a bad street fight, but he's part of management too. Anyone who says that, you're freaking stupid. Stay quiet. But let's move on to the street fight. Was it the best street fight you've ever seen? No, it was an average street fight. And you did see them talk about, before the match happened, you saw a, well, I know that when it came to Joe Henry, he spoke. But they didn't put it on the show. And as much as people say, well, look at YouTube. Now, everyone does. It should have been on the show showing Joe Henry on this this episode. Because we did see a Frankie Kazarian say that when it came down to it with Joe Henry, it should have been my moment. And it wasn't. Honestly, let me give it to you like this. Who is more popular? Is it Joe Henry or is it Kaz? It's Joe Henry. But at this point, seeing that Kaz did make it to the Final Four in the Battle Royal on NXT, which was great. They didn't believe Joe Henry was that good. And I know people said, dude, wait for the process with Joe Henry. There's going to be something. Probably not. Because look what we got. We got Kaz beating the crap out of Ace Steel after he won the match. Joe Henry coming out to try and save him. And this is going to be leading into Posse Slammiversary. Or something else entirely different. I don't know. This is what we're going to get. But do you think it's going to be on NXT? I don't think so. If this is what you're thinking about Joe Henry going back to NXT and having something substantial, I don't think it will be. If he Will he go back? There's a good chance he will. But will it mean something? That's what people don't want to hear. Collaborations have to mean something. As it stands, Tatum Paxley coming over to Against All Odds made a mark that will help her in TKO WWE. When it comes to Joe Henry... He made a mark that would help him in TKO WWE. Does that mean that Tatum Impact is going to be helping something here in TNA Impact? No. Does that mean that Joe Henry is going to have something more substantial in TNA Impact? No. Anything that just happened would be more substantial with TKO WWE. So think about this for a minute. Now let's move on to the next match. We get... Johnny Dango Curtis versus a hmm, Ryan Nimitz. Good match. Ryan did not win the match, which I'm not surprised. I don't know if they're ever going to let Ryan, counting on how long he stays, win a whole bunch of matches and actually go after either the X Division title or the Digital Media Championship. I don't know. When it comes down to it, it's a big question. But the question is going to be, how long will he stay? And will he work more with his brother in a tag team? Now, after it was over, the system came out attacked. And then Ryan and a coming out of Nick saves his butt. The question is, are they going to go after the titles again? I don't know. You guys tell me below. This is what we're going to get. Final match. Eric Young versus Josh Alexander. I did enjoy the vid pack for both of them. It was combined. And it was a good vid pack when it came to Eric Young talking. And he's not a heel here. He's a face. And it was fine. But he was honest. And I like that. He said, look, I know I've done everything here. But here, we're going to face each other again. This is going to be a hard match. It's going to be a brutal match. If you don't want to be world champion, it's one of two things. Either you're a liar or you don't understand what it means to be in the wrestling business. 
and you shouldn't be in it. Basically, that's what he meant. I like that. And, well, Josh did what Josh did. He put over an Eric Young. But when you see the match, you wonder, who did they value more? Is it Eric Young as a TNA original? Or is it Josh Alexander? It's Josh. Josh has been the mainstay of the company for several years now. They believe that he's the only one that they can go forward with next to Moose. Who's already stated. I haven't seen the article yet of what he will be doing in the next five years before his retirement. Because he said he will retire in about five years. I didn't see the article. I just saw the headline of it. I didn't read it. But Josh is what they believe is going to be the one who's going forward. Now the question is going to be here. Where are they going to do, where and when are they going to make an Eric Young important again? Because I don't want to see him as violent by design Eric Young. Or the world class maniac Eric Young. They got to do something new with him and I don't know what they can do. Because as it stands right now, Eric Young going back to being a bad guy, I don't think is wise. I just don't see him going back to being a bad guy right now. He has to stay a face for a while. But what are they going to do with him? That's the question. If he won the Digital Media Championship, maybe that would give him something. Or the X Division, that would give him something. But I don't think they're going to take that off the Rado Kid. And I definitely don't think they're going to take that. Wait a minute. The Rado Kid is still the champion, right? I think he is. And when it comes to Ali, who did have a segment, which unfortunately I missed part of it. My, my stream dropped. I started buffeting. So I don't know what was stated. The only thing I saw was the final segment I'm going to talk about, which is the, the, the date. But I don't know what he said. So I don't know what's going on with him when it comes to him and Campaign Singh. And the jeopardy they're in. I only saw that part and then I missed the rest. But Eric Young's got to do something. He needs a title. I honestly believe he needs a title. If it's a digital media championship, it's the lowest tier title. I'm not happy about that, but it would be good for him. If it is the X Division, you can take off Ali when he's ready and then push him into the main event, which Ali will probably be able to do very well in the main event. That's just me, you guys, from below. If I'm forgetting anything, I'm sorry because I'm not going to keep going. Let me give it to you like this. Hmm. <clears throat> I'm not going to lie here. The minute that I heard that the date was going to be in the ring, I thought this was trash. I thought, why are they not going to just do what they should do? Don't do it in the arena. Don't do it in the ring. Go to an actual establishment, make an arrangement with them, and say, look, we want to pay you a couple of thousand dollars to do this. We want to film and do this. That's what I thought would have been better. And to, and to say that, that's how I felt until I saw halfway through the segment. I know a friend of mine who is, uh, who is subscribed to the channel was laughing his ass off. And I can understand why. There were several funny things that happened. We got Steph Delano who looked like Elvira, Mistress of the Night. Who, who don't, if you've never seen Elvira, Mistress of the Night, go look her up. And you'll see this woman who doesn't have huge boobs. The woman is not like, Whoop. and some drawings, this woman, her tits are usually larger than her head. But others that she got modest boobs, but she is a very curvy woman for her time. Everyone loved her. I loved her. I wanted to marry that woman four times over. <laughs> but when you see that she was dressed as Elvira, you know she's a horror movie buff. That is, that, that is what you get with a Elvira. We see her in the ring, and we see her with, with the table, with whatever's on the table, and someone who looks like a doctor with a champagne, a champagne bottle. And then you see a, yeah, looks like he's ready to just pound her seven days to Sunday once it's all over. He takes her out of that ring, takes her in the back, and he's doing, yeah, like that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's why he was acting. That's the way that PCO was acting. He was going to. Do what he's going to do with Steph Delander. Then he's going to walk into the back nice. He's going to grab her, pin her arm somewhere, and just pound her seven ways to Sunday. That's the way he was acting. But when we got into the ring, I was pissed off. And I'm not going to lie. I was very angry. 
because I, I truly believe this should have been in a setting like a real diner or a restaurant or something as equivalent as possible. Not in the arena, not in the ring, but an actual place. That would have been a nice change of pace for TNA. Very rarely they go outside. Like when they were impact, they rarely went outside of the arena and they just did it there. But here, I was angry. Now, was it funny seeing PCO drink something that looked like sludge? Yeah, it wasn't bad. Was it funny to see Steph try to drink and spit up and she tried to deal with it? Then you see PCO light some candles. Then you see PCO hands her, what was it again? I can't remember what it was. She hand, he hands her something else. And then we get to the food. Well, maybe I should step back. When the conversation that was going on, him going, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you it didn't make me think of Young Frankenstein. If you've never seen Young Frankenstein 1973, go look it up. Because the woman who played young Frankenstein's first love and pounded her into the dirt with his ling ding dong, it gave me that thought. So it did make me laugh. I can't deny it didn't. And then as the conversation went on and you see Steph Delano taking a picture of what it looked like dyed spaghetti and you see him eating it and you see her trying to feed him. I'm like, I'm done with this. I, I hate this. I'm, I'm done. This was total trash. But then you get First Class coming out. And it made sense. First Class got embarrassed by PCO. He comes out with his, his boy Swan. And when they basically nail PCO, zip tie him up to a ring, ring ropes. And that was homie Swan. Zip tying it. And you see Steph Delano who got shoved away by AJ Francis. Who got insulted and got pissed as hell. She smacks AJ Francis. And AJ Francis chokeslam her through the table. Which is perfect. It actually was a good thing to do. Because if they didn't do anything to her. And left her alone. That would have been stupid. And when you hear PCO screaming. Steph. Steph. It made sense. Now. I want to make this clear to you guys, and I'm making it very clear. Even to my friend who would laugh at this, I'm still going to say this. Was this trash or great TV? Trash. I'm saying it right now. It was trash. 100% trash. But it was effective. I am not happy they did this in the ring. I am not happy at all. You can say, dude, what about the fans? Fans helped it to a certain extent, but it was still trash because this is exactly what TNA or Impact Wrestling would normally do. Nothing has changed. I'm telling you now, nothing had changed. When you hear Jordan Grace in an interview say that TNA doesn't feel any different than Impact Wrestling, I agree with her. Nothing has changed. Nothing. This segment, if there was still Impact Wrestling, would still fit Impact Wrestling. So honestly, as much as it's trash, did it do its job to get PCO over and make him sympathetic and show the Steph DeLander sympathetic and AJ Francis a douchebag? It did its job, but it does not mean it did its job well. No matter if you like this or not, I'm telling you now, it was effective but it was still trash because if they have to go to Chicago and they could not find some place that they're willing to spend five or six, a few hundred or a few thousand dollars and say, look, we want to film this. You could have done the nice stuff and you could have still done this afterward because you could have filmed it, shown it. Then you could have Steph Anna come in the ring, talk with PCO. Show more affection of PCO to another flower to Steph. You could still have AJ come out, nail PCO in the face, still strap him up, and then choke slam Steph to Lander. And you would still get the same thing, but at least you would have had an actual setting where it felt like they wanted to put some money into the company. I'm sorry. If you don't believe me, you don't want to hear this, tough shit. But I'm telling you right now. Doing it in the ring was the most 
dumbest thing they could have done for the simple reason that we've been hearing over and over again. Like I said, we got a whole bunch of subscribers coming into TNA Plus over against all odds. Wonderful. But why did your own management say that the ratings are too damn low and were disappointed? They shouldn't have ever said a damn word. If they knew that people were coming through the damn app, why would you talk about damn ratings? Unless the ratings do mean more than what people want to hear who are like us, who are fans or, in my case, a wrestling reviewer who knows that as much as the app will mean something, people traditionally still go by ratings. And if the president of TNA and the president of Anthem still want to see ratings on a network they own and the ratings are low and they complain about it, where's the problem? Is it the wrestlers? No. Is it the writing team or the creative team? No. But it's the management that's the issue and we still have a problem when it comes to now TNA wrestling, not Impact. This was trash, but it was still effective. I'm saying it now. I know you won't like it, but this is how I feel. Have a good day. Have a good night. Oh, it's so hot in here. Peace.